Hi everybody, and I want to now take you through the second part of the question um, in the video of particle motion. Um, if you remember in the first video, we just introduced particle motion related to a sinusoidal function. And then what we did was we talked about um, changing of direction of the particle according to its sinusoidal model. And then in the third part here, we're going to take a look at part B of this question, which you hopefully see right here. Okay. And part B uh, asks us to go ahead and figure out um, what the particle's maximum velocity is, right? Figure out what the particle's maximum velocity is. Okay, so that means, see if they can get that to work. Oh, it did work, okay, good. So that means what we're gonna do is we're going to look at the velocity function and we're going to try to make some conclusions from that velocity function. So that's what I wanna do right here. If you remember our initial position function was this function. When you take the derivative of the position function, you get the velocity function, which is that. Now the velocity function will have some sinusoidal pattern to it as well, right? It might look something like this, who knows, right? We'll just make it up. But if we're looking for the maximum velocity, keep in mind that velocity would be our y-axis variable and time would be our x-axis variable. So our maximum velocity or velocities will occur at the peaks of these scenarios here, okay? That is where our maximum velocities shall be reached. The top peaks will be the maximum positive velocities and the bottom troughs shall be our maximum negative velocities, all right? And um, so, you know, I don't want you to make a mistake and think that the trough is the minimum velocity. It's not. It's just the maximum velocity in the negative direction, okay? And then velocity, the minimum velocity would be zero, and that would occur at the x-intercepts. But what we're going to do is we're going to look for those turning points on our velocity function. So our velocity function is our derivative function. But if we're going to find the maximums i.e. the turning points on our velocity function, we're going to have to find the derivative of the derivative. Okay, so that's a really interesting idea. So we're going to have to find s double prime of t because when we find s double prime of t and then set that equal to zero, that will identify the turning points of our derivative function and the turning points represent the maximum velocities in either direction. Okay, so it's a very kind of uh, like a, multi-layered idea, right? So S double prime of T is gonna to equal to 16, right? Constant multiplier rule. And then the derivative of cos is negative sine 2T multiplied by two. And then we will rewrite this as um, this negative sign. Remember, this is not a subtract. This is a multiply. We're all multiplying. Okay, so it's going to end up actually being negative 32 sine 2t. And now what we want to do is we want to identify the place where this is equal to zero. So that's what we'll do now. Okay, let's go ahead and solve this. And um, the first step in solving it will be to divide the left side by negative 32 and to divide the right side by negative 32. So what we'll end up with is zero equals sine 2t. So the problem very quickly becomes straightforward. And then we're going to want to take the inverse sine of 0, and that's going to equal to 2t. Now think about the sine function before we get to that. When does sine, when is the output value of sine 0? Well, the output value of sine is 0 at 0 at um, pi and at two pi, right? So what we'll do is we will consider those three scenarios and we'll go ahead first and we'll say zero equals two t, t equals zero. So maximum velocity apparently is right at the very beginning. Then what we'll say is pi equals two t, t equals pi over two. So apparently at pi over two, we're going to have a maximum velocity. 
And then we will also go one step further and we will say that 2 pi equals uh, 2t. So t equals pi. Okay, so at time 0, at time pi over 2, which is about 1.57, and at time pi, which is about 3.14, maximum velocity in this scenario is reached. Okay, and that's really interesting. Um, now remember, the period of the sine function that is being used to model the uh, derivative of velocity is having a period of uh, 2 pi over 2, which is pi. So every pi units, the pattern shall repeat. And so um, you could make a further argument that maximum velocity is reached at t equals 0 plus k times however many periods you want to complete. Also, you could say that t equals pi over 2 plus k times however many units uh, periods you want to repeat. And then you could also say that t equals pi plus however many times you want to repeat it. So k, k being the number of, k represents the number of times that you repeat the pattern, right? So if you want to figure out the next time, you write in 1 for k, and then 2 for k, and then 3 for k, and it'll keep getting the repeated values, okay? Now what we'll do is we'll finally, so we'll just recognize that our, our uh, derivative function, uh, if you recall, just go back again now, and our derivative function was this, negative 32 sine 2t, and we'll just verify on Desmos that those turning points occurred at 0, pi over 2, and pi. So if I go back into Desmos now, and I'll try to recapture Desmos so we can see that. Okay. And hopefully Desmos will be active for us, and we'll type in negative 32 sine 2x. Okay, and we get a graph that's uh, very steep. And let's change those settings on it. And what we're trying to do, well, actually that, if you remember, that was the, I should, I should be very careful because that function there was our derivative of the derivative. That was our second derivative. But our first derivative function was 16 cos 2x, right? That was our first derivative function, so I apologize about that. 16 cos 2x, right? That was our first derivative function. And, the, and now let's just change the settings so that we can see that properly. So remember that the turning points of our first derivative represent the maximum velocities. So let's just change our maximum y value to like 20. And let's change our minimum y value to negative 20. So we can see our graph clearly, right? We wanna see our graph really clearly. And then let's just go back to our graph and look, the turning point occurs at zero, pi over two, right? And then we got pi, okay, and so on. And so you see like my point is, just go, let's go back and finish off now because we don't wanna use too much more time. But my point is, is that what we identified in our graph was the idea that the turning points of our velocity function would occur at zero, pi over two, and pi. And um, the way we did that was we took our second derivative, which was this function here, we took our second derivative and set it equal to zero because when you take the derivative, derivative of the velocity function, you get the second derivative and when you set the second derivative equal to zero, if it identifies the places on the slopes on the velocity function that are zero. Um, and, and that means those correspond to maximum velocities, okay? So it's a very like multi-layered idea, and, uh, but the answer matches up with our velocity function very well. And I hope that that makes sense. I do appreciate it's a fairly complex topic, but Thank you for your time, and I hope that you can understand why things worked out that way.